Welcome to Guess and Gusco, SCAD's virtual series of conversations and digital content with the creators and innovators remaking culture. I'm Carmela Spinelli, SCAD fashion historian and recruitment specialist, and I'm happy to introduce Rupal Patel. Rupal Patel joined Saks Fifth Avenue as senior vice president, fashion director in September of 2015. In this role, Ms. Patel plays a key role in forecasting the trends that underpin Saks Fifth Avenue's buying activities, articulating the luxury retailer's seasonal fashion message, and discovering emerging designers and collections. Prior to joining Saks, Ms. Patel founded and directed Rupal Patel Consulting, a creative consultancy focused on brand development, positioning, merchandising, retail strategy, and trend forecasting. Additionally, Ms. Patel served as Moda Operandi's Executive Fashion Director, Neiman Marcus's Senior Accessory Market Editor, and Bergdorf Goodman's Senior Fashion Director. During her 10 year plus tenure at these luxury houses, Ms. Patel was recognized for her ability to source emerging fashion, talent, and trends. Her experience and expertise speak to the multifaceted approach necessary to succeed in today's global marketplace. As a result, she is a trusted source for the media and is regularly quoted as a fashion industry insider by publications such as Vogue, Elle, Women's Wear Daily, The New York Times, Business of Fashion, The Wall Street Journal, and many others. In 2017, Ms. Patel was added to Harper's Bazaar 150 Most Fashionable Women, and I'd love to see your closet, RuPaul, for her <laughs> exceptional time. sense of style. Anytime. Furthermore, due to her influential reputation and leadership, Ms. Patel is a mentor to the Council of Fashion Designers of America Fashion Incubator, a business development program aimed at advancing and sustaining the next generation of fashion designers in New York City. She also serves on the executive committee for the Whitney Museum Contemporaries and make sure to follow her at Rupal underscore Patel on Instagram. Today, Rupal will be in conversation with another alumni of Saks Fifth Avenue and former fashion director, now the Dean of SCAD School of Fashion, Michael Fink. Now, before we begin, we're going to do a poll, the poll questions. And today you have the chance to win the book Digital Luxury, Transforming Brands and Consumer Experiences. And so here we go. First, what would you like to hear more about? How to stay true to your own voice. Number two, how to stand out as a designer in the digital world. Number three, I love all these little things going. The importance of a business plan, especially now. And the last one is expanding diversity in design. So we'll see what's happening. And so far it's really looking like how to stand out as a designer in the digital world, but we will go on and after the conversation, you'll be able to answer some questions and ask Rupal some questions and she'll be able to answer them for you. So put them in the chat and Dean Fink's gonna be able to handle it. So now I pass it over to you, Dean Fink and Rupal. Thank you, Carmela. Thank you, Carmela. And so the um, how to stand out as a de designer in the digital world was the one that got the most. Great, we're gonna be talking about that for sure. So what, Rupal, Welcome back to SCAD, I should say. You've visited with us several times already. And I'm looking forward to having a conversation and decoding what a fashion director does. But I don't think very many people, I know I didn't, had, had a, have a dream about being a fashion director early on. How did you get to this role? Let's do a little bit of background check here. How did that happen? How much time do you have? First of all, Michael, it's such a pleasure to see you. Thank you and Carmela for the invitation to come back to SCAD virtually. I have such fond memories of coming to SCAD and I, I have pieces of art that or photography that I actually bought on my trip there, which I have in my home today, which I hold very dear. So thank you. Um, I'm really honored and really excited to be here. But it's, it's actually really funny that you should ask that question. You spending time as fashion director at Saks, I think 
it is something that I get asked a lot. And I think people have had this myth around fashion directors for so long. You know, when I first started, it was a very glamorous position. You know, fashion directors attended shows and they, they told people, lip told, what the trends were gonna be and what you should be wearing. And we're kind of really the connectors of the design world to the retail world. And I think, you know, as I've been in and out of this role as fashion director now, I don't wanna age myself for 20 years. <laughs> I've been in, yeah. I've been in retail for 26 years, um, or 25, give or take. And I think the one thing I always say when people ask me about fashion director, it's almost like fashion directors are the translators and the curators of what we're seeing within the fashion world, what the designers' voices are, and translating them for the final customer. And these days, it's so much more than going to a show and saying, I like look one 35 and 46. These days it's really using that sort of, I always, I always relate it back to a mural, taking all of the voices that I see and the designer's visions of New York, London, Milan and Paris, and then pulling out and editing down what we feel is going to be best for the Saks Fifth Avenue customer. And then taking all of those assets and those images and those trends and starting to map it out, whether it's the Saxit list of the top trends, whether it's our key looks for marketing that we would like to present for them to place across social, digital, print, ad, how it translates into our holiday windows, which is going up in Fifth Avenue in two weeks. I mean, there's so much that goes into it today, but I always like to say that I'm just like, I'm this little translator. I'm a fashion translator, but it's, it's changed because there's a real business behind fashion too. Retail is, the fashion industry is a billion, billion dollar business across the globe. So there's a lot of dollars and cents involved too. Well, let's talk about the business aspect here. Joining us uh, in our students and faculty, we have accessory designers, fashion designers, fibers designers, jewelry designers. We have wow. marketing and management and luxury students. So you bring up a very important point, how this all comes through you and your office to become a reality in the store. What is the importance of the business plan for a developing designer? You know, I, I, I think one of the things that I've learned in my career, not even just at Saks, but I've had the opportunity to work with small designers, whether it was at the CFDA incubator, whether it was at the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund, and now, you know, working with small designers on a day-to-day -day level, I think you can be the most creative and talented designer out there. But as we move forward into this new world, a business plan and having a sense of just basic general business from accounting to how you're going to see your business set up strategically within the next year to two years, just sort of having a framework is really helpful. You know, it's almost like, you're able to put a plan together and how all this is gonna transit. I think a lot of the designers that I've come across have, you know, have been very fortunate, shall we say, to have a, you know, there's a left brain, right brain component. So they find a partner who has the business fundamentals, but I'm kind of an alpha. Like I like to know everything. I don't wanna just know if I, you know, when I had my business, I didn't wanna just know one part of it and be responsible for it. I wanted to know all of it. So that's why I encourage, whether I'm mentoring a young designer, working with them on the merchandise, like, do you understand your business? Like, this is your name. This is your talent. If you don't know everything that's going on and take responsibility for that side of the part, the business, it's only gonna, I don't, I think you have more power and more knowledge to develop a brand when you understand all the facets. So I highly encourage everyone to take you know, a business 101 course, it, as, even as intimidating as it is, and believe me, I've taken them. You know, I'm a creative too. So it's getting to learn that knowledge when you're in a room and I have them every day full of numbers, you know, numbers people. It's like, it's okay. Like it helps, trust me. <laughs> and all of our students take a business course. Not necessarily do you have to know how to do a gross margin, but really the, the, uh, the basics, you know, the, the, 
the days of an overnight success are, are virtually gone in terms of, of design. And part of the joys of being a fashion director, nurturing young talent, is when you find somebody that really has that vision, who really has a knack, a distinctive voice. How do you how do you work with that talent to nurture them through the process to getting um, a little bit of floor space at Saxon Avenue? Well, you, I think it's you know that's one of the the most favorite parts of my job, what I love to do is finding new designers and working with them. And I, I think it's through the time, we have a screen share now. Um, <laughs> I think it's, you know, I think there are a lot of different elements and things I can say, but I think one of the best parts of, sorry, I got distracted by that screen share. No, I mean, it, it's, what, it's what I love to do. And I think the beauty is, is that you're seeing so many young designers now go and launch their own brand. So there's so many designers to scout and bring on board. In the level of like, how are we developing and nurturing them? It's these, with, with the way business is today, it's no longer like you just go, you see a designer and you see a show, you know, in the showroom, you write an order and then you say, okay, bye-bye, see you later. There's so much that goes into launching a brand from not just the floor space, but from the investment that we're placing within the brand to having our teams across all channels, all stores, have knowledge of who the designer is, starting to activate and create brand awareness for our customers on who this new designer is, where they come from, where their story, you know, what's their story. And that's not just in store, that's on digital, that's on social, there's a huge marketing piece marketing piece that comes into play on this. So our, you know, the, the Saks merchant team, the Saks marketing team, there, there's so much work that goes into building a young designer brand. And I think when I look at our floor and I look at, you know, our roster, like we're very proud to, to be able to say that. I mean, I, we have some of the best young talent out there and coming into Saks as well as we move forward into 2021, it's an ongoing commitment that we've made and that we continue to make. So, I mean, I, I think of like, you know, Kate, you know, this New York City brand and you think of Kate's collection and how it's grown so much. Or you think of two small brands came out of Colombia, Johanna Ortiz and Sylvia Charassi that now are becoming household brands in the Saxis Avenue customer base or it, you know, Christopher, Christopher John Rogers is coming to Saks, you know, in spring 21. So there's like, it's always on. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the hallmarks of Saks Fifth Avenue, just celebrating American talent as well. So when our students are getting their ideas together, their brands, their, their, their plans together, how much attention are you paying to social media? How, how what, are, what are hours a day are you spending just combing social media for talent, for ideas um, to nurture? I think, you know, I think social media is becoming much more of a news source now than it ever has been before. And I'm not gonna lie, ever since the pandemic began and the virus started to spread, we all went into lockdown, it became a main way of communication, right? And to learn about different things. And I think it only continues and as we, for me, as I'm looking for new brands or new talents, we're most certainly not just myself, but we're all finding new brands and new talent on, you know, on Instagram. I mean, TikTok is something that I think is changing how fashion is today and how we're seeing it. And it's a huge tool. You know, I also think in how consumers are, are trans, you know, transacting. They see something on, you know, they see something on Instagram or they see something on TikTok and boom, it's purchased or it's sold out all of a sudden. So social media is huge. It's very important. I'm not going to lie. And it's becoming a part of, it, it should be a part of a grand, of a brand's strategy to grow. So that, that visual, the messaging of that is extremely important. Get the old stuff down, keep the new stuff up. Uh, have a critical eye on your own work. I mean, Michael, where 
we're in the business of fashion. We're all about aesthetics. We're all about, it's all about an image, isn't it? And I'm not even just saying like an image, but like fashion, whether it's a dress, a jacket, a shoe, a piece of jewelry, there's beauty and there's beauty in the piece and the object, the subject matter. So I think it's amazing that we, we have a tool. We have something called Instagram or whatever you want to use. We have a tool that lets us enhance the beauty of what, what we're in the business of doing. And it allows us to expand our creative, our creative talents to bring more of our individual signature and personality to it. We just need that touch app. We want to feel everything. Yes, we do. we do, but that's changed. Sometimes we can't touch everything and we've all had to be more versatile and adopt in this new, this new normal, this new way of working. So one of the things that I'm really so proud of our students is during, uh, during this time, uh, I've been looking at all, all of the senior work and the creativity is still there. They are still dreaming. The ideas are mu multitudes of ideas. Um, the spirit is there. We've gone through these kinds of situations before. Can you just tell us from your own experience, whether it was 9-11 or the Great Recession, how do we, how do we pick ourselves back up and continue forward? Well, <laughs> I I'm, thank you for asking. I mean, to everyone here, I applaud you. And I just want you all to give yourselves a big pat on the back or a big hug because you guys are here, you've gone through, honestly, one, like the most difficult thing that we as a, we as humans have gone through in, in I think the history of mankind. And, you know, I, I've, I've heard a few different things of being like, wow, like no one's ever, you know, I've, I'm the only one experiencing this or our generation is going through this and you, you, you know, other generations haven't. And it's, it's interesting that Michael, we talk about this. You know, I, I, I was, um, I was an editor at Condé Nast when 9/11 happened. I was working for Style.com, which is now Vogue.com. And when 9/11 happened, I lost my job. They, they exited about 50 employees, and I was one of them. And I lost my job. I'd never been fired before. I never not worked. You know, and it was devastating. I think I was like 27. I was like 26, maybe, yeah, around 26 years old. And I thought I was not going to recover from that. I was like, what's going to happen to me? And it was such a learning lesson to sort of see that, you know, the fashion industry, designers, collectively, the organ the, all of these organizations were working to pick themselves back up and move back into a position of moving forward. You know, and I think of that on a personal level for me that I've also experienced when the recession of 2009 happened, many of us had job positions or roles that were changed. I was at Bergdorf Goodman as the senior fashion director and moved to Neiman Marcus, you know, and that was something that, again, when it's not your plan and it's not part of your path, what you think you should be doing, I, I wasn't very happy about it at the time, but in hindsight, if I hadn't had that experience at Neiman Marcus and being able to, which was an amazing experience to work for such an incredible luxury retailer, I just love Bergdorf Goodman so much. I didn't want to leave. But if I hadn't done that, I never would have been able to have become senior vice president and fashion director for Saks Fifth Avenue, that knowledge. So it's always, I always find, and I know this sounds cliche, but I always find that there's like when you look back, there's some little silver lining. There's something that's meant to happen that you're not aware of. And in this time, as creatives, we're all being challenged more now than ever before to like really tap into what we know and that's our creative space and to really make sure that we're caring and nurturing and developing our creative voices because that's who we are inside. And I, I think in what I... The hope that I have is that, and something I saw very strongly this season, you know, I didn't know what, to, we didn't know what to expect from the designer collections that we saw in New York, London, Milan, and Paris. We thought it was gonna be very safe, very commercial clothing. There was such joy, happiness, and optimism. 
from all of the designers, from all of the big houses, from all, all designers in general that you're like, wow, fashion, the design community has such optimism for 2021. You know, and I think that's something I want to encourage everyone on is that we are an industry and it's been shown time and time again, when things, when chaos happens, when disruption happens, when things, when the, when things change, when the world just stops, fashion has always been known as an industry to move forward, to move ahead, to pick up the pieces. And that's something I always find very interesting is that as designers, you're challenged to look six to eight months ahead, right? And so many designers in this time around particularly were saying, for the first time, I didn't know where we were going to be from six to eight months ahead. But I think that that joy and optimism of bringing that vision forward is something that's very meaningful and very much needed right now. So that's like, I, I just think that we are an industry of resilience. When things are down, we get up and we always move forward. Fashion it's, is about the future, always. It's so true. And you, you bring up another aspect of the industry that really doesn't get talked about nearly enough. We've all seen the films about backstabbing in the fashion industry and just, just <laughs> doing the other guy in, but there is a real community in the fashion industry that supports each other, that, that collaborates with each other, that respects each other. Uh, when I'm at Saks and you were at Bergdorf Goodman, going to shows, it's all community and everybody is very con congenial and familial. Um, it is a very precious commodity that, that these relationships have in the industry. And again, they're not celebrated enough because in times like this, we really rely on each other to find solutions and as you say, push forward, which is what we have to do. So that, that resilience and that stamina really come into play. Uh, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned the last round of shows, what kind of design work is really interesting to you at this moment, in this moment of change? Not favorite designers, but, but what's leading the new thought, the new, uh, the new future? I think what I'm finding very interesting right now, and for me, it's also very different is how designers are starting to look ahead by fusing this idea of lifestyle, fashion, beauty together. You know, there's a practicality right now as well in terms of if someone shows me an evening gown or something, I'm like, I love it, but where is he or she going in it right now? So I like, I like, I'm very much right now about fashion, design, quality, integrity, that actually like it's wearable, it's usable, it's, it's transactable. You know, that's my left brain, right brain working together. And, and how do you feel the industry, and we have a long way to go, but in terms of sustainability of, of our responsibility in the industry, how are, how are the, uh, the designers at Saks Fifth Avenue or Saks itself encouraging uh, this motion forward? Well, I think, I mean, again, I, I think we all are, we're all looking ahead. And I think sustainability is something that didn't just begin when the virus started, but it had been a big conversation before. And I, you know, Saks has been very, very open and bringing on sustainable brands into the framework and working on utilizing that again within messaging to our consumers you know so i think it's something that doesn't stop but i think it's an evolution yes there is much work but still to be done by all of us you know and lots of education as well on what sustainability means i think sustainability became like a trend. It became a hot word, like everything's sustainable, everything like, oh, now you're in trend, now it's PC. Okay, let's like, let's rock and roll now. But I, you know, when I hear someone, for example, like Stella McCartney, who I've known for many years and have tremendous respect for, you know, when Stella unveiled her collection this season, she said that she went during this time of quarantine back into asking herself questions of what, what is she, what is she here for? What is her purpose? You know, where is she going with all this? And she created an A to Z manifesto. 
And again, Stella is the original, she's the OG of sustainability when it comes to leading this within fashion. And I thought it was very interesting that someone, you know, such as Stella McCartney, who's been a pioneer in this, is still continually challenging herself to examine this. So I don't have all of the answers. I'm not the expert in this, but I know that there's still much work to be done as an organ, as a, as a industry. Without doubt. At the beginning, they said to Stella, it couldn't be done, but look at her now, and just the progress, the continuing. Yeah, for, sure. for sure, but I think Stella's a great example because she's, she's major and she's still challenging herself. So let's turn the conversation just a little to the customer and uh, we're all reading you know, trend reports. What are you seeing with the SACS in terms of the, the day in day out business of, of what's propelling sales right now? And what are they telling you they want? What do they need now? Well, I mean, like under $100, uh, slippers, you know, things, things that we normally wouldn't put in a trend report. Well, no, I mean, I think, listen, I think the world, I think consumers right now are shopping this, this new way we're all living. You know, I think consumers are definitely looking for clothing and fashion that is relatable in this time and space that we're in. You know, I think everyone is still looking to feel put together and wanting that fashion has a thirst for fashion. And we're seeing, you know, we're seeing across, we're seeing like that people are still shopping, which is fantastic. You know, I think things I can't tell you in a trend report, you know, it's hard to sort of provide all this information on specifics, but I do feel that I think it's very encouraging and very helpful to know that I think when seasons change, people immediately are like, oh my God, I need to get new clothes. It's getting cold, you know? So again, we're moving from summer to winter, but I also, and I'm gonna be very honest, like I think everyone kind of got really bored of sitting around at home within their sweatpants and their sweatshirts. And I think we're starting to see a backlash to being like, hey, it's time to get dressed up again. Whatever dressed up means, and it's not, I think, you know, this idea of we're not going to the office anymore. We're not wearing suits. We're not wearing jackets. So I think even then, just from a trend point of view, it's like the J.P. Morgan Credit Suisse guys no longer have to wear a jacket, tie, and shirt to work. So how are they going to be dressing for their Zoom meetings and their financial calls these days? It's a definite more lifestyle approach. For, for for the the mom, you know, work at home, now work at home mom, who's managing her Zoom calls with her clients in the morning and has to go at three o'clock to pick, you know, drop off, get to like, not wearing that sheath dress with those, you know, spiky heels anymore. It's a shift. So I haven't think a tie still looks good. Um, no, it does, but I think, I think again, like it, it's so interesting to see that the pandemic really has created such a shift in, in fashion and how we're all dressing. Like the first few weeks or like two months, like I was wearing shoes, I was wearing heels. And now like after like, now I'm like, oh, like it's a heeled boot. Do I really wanna wear that today? Like it's just how we're starting to think these days. Well, enough of me talking. We have a lot of questions coming in from the students and I think I'm gonna, Take, uh, ask some questions from them, if you don't mind. Is that all right with you? I would love that. All right. Um, uh, question to you is, has your experience been similar in all the companies and positions that you have worked in, in terms of equality as a person of color and as a woman? Wow, what a question. You know, it's, it's who, I'm like, who asked that question? That's from uh, Asta. Hi, Asta. I see you. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. I'm good. It's so nice to get to talk to you. I've been following you ever since that article came about you and Forbes along with Indra Nui. And it's such a good opportunity to be able to talk to you. Wow, oh, it's a pleasure. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm you know, it, it's very interesting. This year for me personally has brought up obviously a lot of different a lot of different, it's made me reflect on a much deeper level than I probably ever have about being 
about being Indian, about being a woman of color and about being in this industry. When I first started and made the decision to go into fashion, when I was 20 years old, I'm 46 years old now. I've been in this industry for 26. I never thought, you know, I never thought about this. I think I always just felt lucky to have a seat at the table and I worked hard to get to where I am from the bottom up. And I've been very lucky to work for companies that have been very open and very welcoming and very receptive to my talent, you know, and to encouraging me to go and move beyond and to opening doors and possibilities. So for me, I, I feel that that's been something that I don't really know, you know, this year in particular made me really look and say, I've been very blessed and I've been very fortunate, but I think when I started, you just felt lucky to, you just felt lucky. You know, I never thought, I never wanted to think I'm Rupal Patel, like I'm Indian, I'm Rupal Patel and I'm interested in being in fashion. I've always just wanted to say, like, my thought has always been like, I'm Rupal. That's, that's it. So, but with this year, there comes a lot of responsibility to help, you know, to help designers from different backgrounds, from different areas, different minorities to help achieve their dreams. And it's something I'm very committed to. There are a lot Thank of questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. There are several questions. Just how does one work their way up to jobs such as fashion director at a brand like Bergdorf or Saks? Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, honestly, back to your authenticity as well. I mean, where did that spark happen where fashion just ignited your life? Since I was a kid, you know, I always loved clothes. I always loved fashion. My parents, my dad's a doctor. You know, my mom, my mom always got dressed up in elaborate saris and orange and pink and like full, like gorgeous. I always love clothes. I always love fashion. I always wanted what, like the new trend, the new sneaker, like whatever it was, I always wanted it. But in those days, there wasn't, if you weren't going to be a designer, like there was no path to going to become a designer when I went to NYU in 1991. Like I didn't know about this industry and I fell into it. And my first job was sweeping floors and folding sweaters at Urban Outfitters on Fridays and Saturdays when I was at NYU to make pocket money, you know? So I, how did I, how did I get here? I, I, I literally worked from the bottom up. Every time I was given an opportunity or a job or I never said no. I said, okay, let me try it. I've done intern, like internships for Juicy when Pam and Gila launched. Um, I worked as an assistant you know, as an executive assistant in the fashion office at Bergdorf's for three years, faxing, we don't fax anymore, but faxing requests, scanning, you know, doing anything, expenses, you name it. I just, and when I found out what a fashion director was, I was like, I am not going to stop doing this. I want to be a fashion director. And when I opened up, you know, I think the part when I I had been in retail for so long. At one point I was just like, you know, I, I need to start seeing things through a different light. And that's how I became, I launched my own company for four years and that was fascinating. But I, I think my advice is like, how do you, everyone thinks, oh, fashion director, so glamorous. Like we keep going back to that, right? <laughs> but honestly, how do you get to the job or the role you want? Know where you're going, know what you want first. Like getting to the destination is a hell of a lot easier when you know where you're going. Put a plan together, be open-minded, never say no. I think that's something I see where everyone's like, oh, I can't do that. It's like, well, why can't you do that? I still pick up garment bags wherever I am. At this stage of my career, if I need to get something done, I'll do it myself. No job too big no, or small for me to do. If it's gonna help put my dream into action, be passionate, be dedicated, hardworking, you know? And that's something that was an interesting reminder for me, it, something happened in my career at one point. Like you think you've got it, well, guess what? There's someone right next to you who wants it just as bad. So how are you gonna get it? 
and it's 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 kind of interesting when you think about like fashion director and all of these roles it's most of the people that I speak with it was never just handed to them like they had to work and they had to earn it so that's something I think which is really important like don't get and I've I've been thrown off this path a few times. Don't get discouraged, as I've told you, and as I shared my own story, even when things like layoffs or global pandemics or <laughs> things of this nature happen, it's the universe showing you that there's a different way to go and they're, they want to like sort of realign you. And I've always, the destination sometimes has been much better than what I would have imagined for myself. This is such great advice, Rupal. It's the determination, the, uh, the confidence that you need, because in this business, you're always pushing or pulling a rack, or for those of you who've ever worked in a store, you get hanger rot, which is these horrible black lines that, that <laughs> form on your fingers. Very close I always say it comes, back to a, it always comes back to a garment bag, always for me, always. I'm always um, a garment bag. <laughs> A different question here, just uh, in light of the recent uh, fashion season. How do you feel about the virtual fashion shows? Honestly, I'm very grateful for it because if we didn't have virtual fashion shows and if we didn't have virtual fashion weeks, we wouldn't be seeing the collections. Is it the same as being at a show? No, nothing, nothing, nothing will replace that. I mean, it's just, I think there's something in going to a physical show that allows you to really connect into like the designer's vibe, their thinking, their creative space and their energy. And you really get to process and see the show. You get to process the collection in a very different way. However, with that being said, I was so impressed with how all the different designers like did such innovative, had such innovative and ways to present the collection to this season. I mean, J.W. Anderson for Loewe literally like had cutouts of every single exit that you could like literally pin and, you know, post up on your walls and it was called show in a box or Joseph Altazar sending sketches and handwritten notes in the book that inspired him to create his show or, I mean, the list, the list goes on. So I think that was something I really appreciated that there was such an authenticity and genuine connection with so many of the designers this season that we never would have experienced if we had attended the show. I mean, Raph and Mucha. I mean, who saw Raph and Mucha's? Who saw that collab live? I mean, we, right? I mean, that was major to see Raph and Mucha like having a Q and A with one another. If I was at that show in Milan and saw that, we never would have experienced that dialogue between them. And that, that's like, that's fashion magic. That's like fashion gold. Those are the moments that you're like, wow. I'm getting uh, some questions just concerning the luxury market in particular. What do our students really need to know uh, as a designer, as an entrepreneur, entering that luxury market, which is a very special customer who continues to evolve? What advice do you give in targeting that market? You know, I think luxury these days is what we think of like luxury. Luxury is so much, I think we always define it with like the caring and the LVMH brands or Chanel, but I think luxury is translating into so many other areas of fashion, accessories, jewelry, and shoes as well. I think one of the most important things in launching a brand within the luxury market is to make sure that you are very clear and very defined on what your signature is, what you're adding to this luxury space, being very informed within your placement within the luxury, within what it, that luxury space, and being able to almost carve out a niche for yourself to be able to position it. I think that's a part when I'm looking at, you know, someone very interesting like Telfar. Telfar won the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund three years ago, two years ago. And Telfar has created, you know, his Bushwick bag. And that was something he had way long before. And that's, that's luxury. That, that bag is a luxury bag. But Telfar did it in such a different way. You know, I look at his marketing and his how innovative and how, you know, 
he's he's kept it all within his own space and that's not necessarily following the norm like what everyone else is doing he's doing it for what's best for his brand so i think it's also like i look at that as like being able to carve out a niche and being like boom like i'm gonna go here so it's not necessarily a price point either correct i mean the telephone is a perfect example well that's what i i think luxury these days doesn't is not defined by how we all perceive luxury you know i think luxury has has moved beyond that and i also think it's interesting when we talk about like who the consumer is you know everyone thinks that you have to be a certain age to be buying luxury and i think these days the demographics are changing it's a younger customer as well who's looking to save up and spend or wanting to spend, wanting to have that access. So to me, it's always been like luxury is everything from a $25 lipstick to a $125 perfume to, you know, there are different levels of luxury and how you're bringing that in. Great answer. Um, many questions regarding diversity in terms of how Saks in particular diversifying the um, edit of designers in the store. Is there an plan in place or this is an ongoing uh, process at, at Saks for sure, um, but anything that you can address in terms of new collection, collections coming? Yes, well, no, I mean, I think, you know, Saks, you know, Saks has made a commitment, which is a long-term commitment to inclusivity, inclusivity within our organization, within our designer lineup. There was a DNI council that was created in June of this year that will can that is in the process of working and developing our plan as we move forward and how we, you know, as an organization, which I'm very proud of, very proud of to see. Um, in regards to our designer lineup and our commitment, and I think we We've made some very big strides, which for spring 21, which we will be able to announce shortly, which I'm very proud of as well. But I think that's something at Saks that, you know, we're, we're continuing to move forward with and, and take a look at. But again, just it's hard not to, without all of the dot, I's dotted and T's crossed. But yes, no, it's something that is top of mind. And part of our everyday plan for the future. And we're so happy to hear that Christopher John Rogers is going to be yeah. part of SAC's team coming spring 2021. That's amazing. Looking forward to many of our students joining SACS in the future. Um, here's a, here's a, another question from Asa. Now that Versace is moving towards seasonless fashion, do you think more brands will follow? I think, I think, I think there have been a handful of designers who have already started, to be honest with you, seasonless fashion. I think they've been doing it for some time. I think you will start to see more announcements such as Versace moving towards that seasonless fashion as we move forward. Things are shifting, things are changing. They have been, this was something that I think a collective of designers sat down early this year to look at. So it makes sense, you know, when it's, when it's cold outside, you're looking for a coat. When it's warm outside, you're looking, you know, for things that are going to be really relative to warmer weather and weather, warmer climate. So yes, I think it's a good time for designers to reflect and observe on how they want to move forward with, with weights, with texture, you know, in real time. Can you, and, and just following on that, this, this idea of seasons, it's so antiquated in my opinion, just we, we want to wear clothes when we want to wear them. It would be so amazing to watch this kind of thinking continue forward. Uh, and actually propels the industry in a very different way instead of that markdown cycle where we don't sell what's in stock. We can just keep refreshing the floor. And often as, as, a, as a former New Yorker, it's 80 degrees in Savannah today. We don't, we don't realize the, the dramatic temperature changes even in a chain store. So 
it's a it's a very plausible and time to take action on that as well. No, a hundred percent. I don't, I, I agree, but I have to be frank with you. I think for the designers, it's not as easy of a, of a puzzle to put together. You know, I think as fashion has become a bigger platform, I see so many designers now, like they have the challenge of, they have customers in the United States, but they also have customers in Russia. They also have customers in China. They also have customers in Dubai. They also have customers in South America. So it's like, it's going to be interesting to see how designers create those collections to really address their global consumer. And that's something I think, which is always that pressing thing. And that's when we talk about the business and the creative, like how do you fuse them together so that they can, they continue to stay as financially viable and successful as they have been in the past. So I have a question here about private label. And to what extent is Saks involved in private label? And how do you interact with that particular design team and the vendors that produce that for Saks? That's a great question. So we, you know, I think what we've noticed is private label is really on our men's side. You know, I think our women, our ladies are really coming and looking for that fashion, that design or that trend lineup from the brands that, they, that they're looking for. You know, on men's we have, you know, SFA, which is an incredible menswear collection that is really lifestyle driven between tailoring, you know, knitwear, pants, shirting, soft separates. And there is a team that is part of our men's merchant team or buying team that works, you know, with within and is developing it and going to in normal times, going to PT you know, sourcing fabrics and working with our fashion office to evaluate color stories, silhouettes and dev. So it's definitely been something that we've been growing throughout the year, so. Great. And I just want to ask, um, I'm getting a lot of, this is a big question from everyone. How do I join SACS? How do I get into SACS? Where can we direct our students to have a resume to share with, with SACS or a portfolio? Yes, no, I mean, I think that's a part of, how do you get into SACS? Okay, home, like that's kind of where we went back into like, what do you want, right? Like, how are you gonna get there? I love that you asked the question. Mm -hmm. So here's some, right, as a designer, if you're like, oh my God, I wanna see my collection at SACS, please do me a favor, do not DM me on Instagram. Like that, well, that for me is something that is like, how serious are you to get your brand in? What I suggest is email me, please. Wonderful information about you, who you are, your collection. Definitely have your portfolio, your lookbook, your prices all included. That's on the designer side. Now, if you're like, I'd love to come work at Saks, same thing. Please do not DM me on Instagram. That is to me, so I, I, ha I know like, I have to say that to everyone because I think it's something I've noticed. A lot of people like DM me like, hey, I'm looking for a job on sex. I'm like, okay, if you're looking for a job at sex, this is a first impression. This is how I'm looking at how you're, like I'm not going to do the work for anyone. Like find my email address. If not you guys, but I'll give you my email address. <laughs> But it's always so interesting to me, right? Like people who are like, hey, I'd love to send you my resume. Can you give me your email address on DM on Instagram? Like, okay, how serious are you about your career and what you're looking for? First impression. So love, love to send me resume, cover letter. What are you looking for? You're looking to have an informational. Do you have an idea? Do you want to go into buying? Are you looking for what the careers are in marketing? As much information and as much as you're able to share, the more help that we can be in pointing you in the right direction. Oh, and obviously your resume. Such great advice. Know what you want. It's not going to be handed to you. Listen, we're <laughs> almost out of time. <laughs> I'm like, it's not handed. I think it's just something that I find that I have a lot of people who come to me and they don't really know where they want to go. And which is really okay, which is okay. But I think it's really difficult when organizations, you know, organizations are looking to place and 
it's almost really helpful. I always find it very impressive when I meet a candidate and they're like, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. This is what I'm passionate about. And this is how I can add to your organization. Gets me okay. every time. Listen, we're just about out of time and I want to make sure I give you the last word here on, on your hope, your dreams for our students about their, um, regardless of what year they're in in school, but uh, your, your suggestion for them on how to proceed with their dreams. I have, I'm like, first of all, I'm so jealous of where you guys are right now. Like, I wish I could go back into time and, and like, just, I wish I could. Like, it's such a special moment in your lives and to be in this creative space where with no barriers, with no, like you, you get to be free. You really get to like really tap into who you are and your creative spirit. I, I love that we are, you know, it's the time to dream. It's just the time to challenge yourselves to like sometimes push yourselves in those places of like that creative space where you're like, oh, I want to, or you're like, oh, I can't, it's too much. Like, just try it. Who cares if it works? It doesn't work, you fail. It took you like 40 hours to make, you know, to embroider that piece, but it didn't work out yet. Do it, do it. Like, I wish like, I, I, I encourage you all to like really go there right now. Now more than ever, especially we all have our dark days, we all have our light days, but it is like, we're all creatives and we need that. We need to nurture our souls and we need to keep our spirits up. And that's the beauty of fashion and what we all do. I was telling Michael a little earlier, like I actually found myself in a creative rut, like probably about like, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And I just like feeling really heavy. A lot of things going on in the world, as you all know. Um, I'm just being like, God, like I can't find my vibe. Like I can't, I can't find my rhythm. Like where, where am I? Like, what am I doing? And then I was like, that's it. Like, I'm just like the Met, you can go to the Met. I took the day off. I had a vacation day and I went to the Met for like two hours and I, I got to hang out with like, no one was there either. So it was awesome. Like I got to hang out with Monet and Gauguin and Van Gogh and like, just like, like just get my like color therapy, just get my, you know, get that, 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 that soothing inspiration for my soul. And I think that's something that like, don't rest on this, like keep going. I promise you better days are ahead, but it's only gonna be better if you guys are at the top of your game and gotta keep feeding that creative, that creative space within you, okay? I promise, like we're gonna come out of this. It's so beautifully put. Fashion is just a part of our lives. I mean, we connect it to the arts, painting, music, sculpture. It's the complete picture and that's, we have to keep striving for that. And as Sean just wrote, after the plague comes the Renaissance. Yeah. So beautiful. Thank you, Sean. Thank uh, you, Rupal. Sean. <laughs> Rupal, thank you so much for spending time with us today. So appreciative of your words and the story and what the possibility of fashion can be. Thank you so much. No, thank you all. It was so lovely to see everyone. Thank you all for coming today. I'm honestly so humbled and honored. I wish you all well. I look forward to hearing from a few of you. And um, just sending so much light. Please stay safe. Please stay well. And I hope to see you all soon. Michael, I want an invitation to come back so I can buy more photography too. And art. Open invitation anytime. <laughs> Thank and you. Thank you. Scrolling, scrolling thank yous from everyone. Oh my God. Thank you all. Thank no. you so much. <laughs>